Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend, Rick from Blind. Today, we're going to introduce you to Liz Young, who's SoFi's Head of Investment Strategy, responsible for providing economic and market insights to various audiences. Before joining SoFi, Liz was the Director of Market Strategy at BNY Mellon Investment Management, where she formulated and delivered views on macroeconomic themes and their efforts and their effects on capital market. Earlier in her career, she was a portfolio analyst at Baird and a research analyst at BMO Global Asset Management. Liz, you have (laughs) such an impressive resume. Can you walk us through your career for the benefit of the audience here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hit you hit some of the high notes. When I was in college, you know, you you have to make this decision when you're so young of what you want to major in. And I still think that somehow we're doing that backwards as a society, asking a, an 18 or 19 year old kid to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. But I liked math and I liked business. And the best way that I could combine both of those was doing something in finance. So that's what I ended up going into. And I got lucky that I really liked it. And I stayed in it uh, for the duration and then began my career in finance. And, you know, actually one of the tenets to SoFi that we talk about and that our CEO talks about is that we have to know how it works, meaning know how the products work, know how the system works, know how the platform works. I began my career in operations at a trust department for a regional bank. This is back when I was in Wisconsin. I was living in Milwaukee. And there is no better way to know how it works than to work in operations. I learned a lot on that side of the business coming up. I spent about four years there and then took my first big leap into what I would consider the real part of the investment business. And I say this to the the young professionals that I mentor. I would tell this to anybody. I believe that there are pivotal moments in everybody's career. You might get lucky enough to have a handful of pivotal moments. You might end up only with one or two pivotal moments. But the first big one that I had was when I left operations and I was given my first job in investment management in the investment world. And I had a market strategist who took a chance on me. I was just a kid. I was so green. I didn't know up from down. I didn't know anything about the business. And he took a big chance on me. He believed in me and got me on my runway. And that's where I really fell in love with investing and also with strategy. And that's where my pipe dream came from. I wanted to be the him of a company someday, but I was 26, right? Nobody was going to give me that job anytime soon. So I had to figure out what were the steps along the way. And there were uh, a number of years spent as an analyst, which I think was really important for me to lay the groundwork and learn how to write and learn how to speak and learn the vernacular. And I went through the CFA program while I was an analyst. And then the next big pivotal moment was so at the end of those analyst years, I was given another big chance to move to New York City and become a strategist. I was sort of thrown to the wolves. I had to travel. I was on the road all week, every week. I was speaking at events. I was meeting with financial advisors and helping them allocate their portfolios. And frankly, I never looked back. So here I am, still a strategist, a different company now. Now I've built the investment strategy function at SoFi. And I'm doing all of the content creation uh, and investment strategy work for this company. When you say strategist, how does that really play out? Does that mean that you would go to a portfolio manager or some financial entity and give your insights in terms of X amount in bonds, X amount in stocks, X amount in crypto? Is that sort of what you do in part? So that's that's a little more prescriptive than what most strategists would do, uh, mm-hmm. given that everybody's investment relationship is different and, and everybody's time horizon is different. We don't do you know a certain amount in each. But what I do do is talk a lot about the attractiveness of asset classes, and that can be as broad as somebody needs it to be or as granular as somebody needs it to be. So for example, we might talk first about what regions of the world are looking attractive from a stock market perspective and why? What do the economies around the world look like and why does that make their markets more or less attractive than perhaps being a domestic investor in the United United States? One of the things that I think is really important just as an overarching theme is that 
I take macroeconomic data and connect it to capital markets. So you have people who are economists and they talk about economic data and what's happening in, in the very granular parts of an economy, but it can be difficult sometimes to link that to what happens in financial markets and, and understand how that data feeds through into actual assets that you own in your account. So that's one of the biggest things I do. And particularly at SoFi, because we have a younger member base, uh, the the mantra for my team, or when I, when I began the team and thought about what are we really trying to accomplish here, it was reach teach, empower. We want to reach as many people as possible because there, we realize there's a huge gap in the education of investing and then teaching people and arming them with the education and the content that they need to feel more confident, to be empowered, to really take an active role in their own investing journey. Some of the education is just what what does the market do over history? What's normal, right? And, and there's really no such thing as normal. But if we take an average, a lot of times it's looking at the market with a lens of there are always going to be bumps in the road. And the average pullback, the average what we would call correction in any year is about 13 or 14 percent. And that seems pretty big, especially after a couple of years where we've had double digit positive returns. And it can it can seem like it's harder to stomach because we're just not used to it. It hasn't happened recently. But reminding people that history should serve as at least some type of guide for what could happen and what is regular in markets going forward and, and getting particularly newer investors used to that idea. Education is something that I just feel very strongly about on market cycles and business cycles. And the fact that there are always the same phases of a business cycle. The business cycle itself doesn't go away or get canceled, but those phases could last longer or shorter than they have in the past. So understanding how to identify where we think we might be in the business cycle at the moment, and then taking it a step further. What does that mean? for asset classes? What does that mean usually in the economy? Is inflation normally high during this part of the cycle or is it low during this part of the cycle? What does unemployment look like during this part of the cycle? And giving people that sort of education so that when they hear the data, they read the headlines, they know that it doesn't mean that they have to freak out every time a headline seems sensational or, or dramatic, that understanding just here's here's the data that came out Here's what it means, and I don't necessarily need to do anything about it. You mentioned earlier that many folks, you included, were lucky to have these pivotal moments in your career mm -hmm. that really changed the trajectory. Mm -hmm. Can we dig into this? How can someone yeah. put themselves in the shoes of getting more opportunities to have those pivotal moments, if that's possible even. Yeah, I mean, it's great if it just lands in your lap, right? <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the easiest way for it to happen. But the reality is that that's not how it works. Um, both of mine happened in different ways. I think one of the one of the really important pieces is that opportunities will come. The key, first of all, is that you have to be listening, right? They may not be loud. They may not be coming through a megaphone. They may not be somebody shaking you by the shoulders and saying, you have to consider this. They may be quiet and you have to be listening for it. The second thing is you have to be willing to say yes. If you say no, the opportunity never happened. You have to be willing to say yes, put yourself outside your comfort zone. I'll take those two pivotal moments that I talked about and, and give you an explanation of each. So the first one I was ready to get out of operations. I wanted to do something else. I wasn't really sure what. I was finishing up my master's degree and I was like hungry and eager and ready to do something different. And I thought I wanted to do completely different things. I thought I wanted to be in corporate finance. I had interviewed for a couple of corporate finance jobs. I thought I wanted to be the CFO. I didn't get the the jobs that I had interviewed for. You know, it, to be perfectly honest, many of the those those pivotal pivotal moments I had interviewed for other positions before them, and I didn't get the jobs. The pivot point came after that, not in something I was even trying to find. That first moment, because the the HR person at the company I was with knew that I was looking, she came to me after you know a few months of us trying to figure out what the other options were. She said, "Hey, there's this." market strategist in investment management who needs an analyst. 
what do you think about giving it a shot? I looked at the job description. It wasn't anything that I had considered. And I was like, I am not, I am nowhere near qualified for this. The, I am probably the youngest person that he'll interview. I don't have a writing sample. I don't have any of this stuff that he wants. And, and she said, well, he's interviewed a lot of people. He doesn't like any of them. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know, she said, I'm kind of at a loss for what he really is looking for. So let's give it a shot. And reluctantly, I said, okay, you know, I, I didn't think that it was going to go anywhere. And I was the last person he interviewed. I was the least experienced person he interviewed. And there was something about the chemistry that he was looking for. He wanted somebody to mentor. He was in the twilight of his career at the time. He liked my attitude. He liked my hunger. And I think he wanted somebody that didn't have a bunch of their own habits already established, right? I was young, I was malleable, and I was eager for him to teach me how the world worked in, in the world of markets. So I ended up getting that job. I still, to this day, sometimes ask him, why in the world? <laughs> what possessed you to give me that chance? But it, it completely changed my life and it completely changed the trajectory of my career. I still talk to him today. He just texted me last week and the text said, all it said was, Good morning and good luck figuring out these markets. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it's it was one of those those big moments. But again, I had to be pushed into it. And then I had to be willing to say yes to something that I didn't think I was ready for. And frankly, that I didn't even know I'd be interested in. Thank thank goodness I did. Thank goodness I I took a chance as much as he took a chance on me. And then the next time where I had that pivotal moment, I'd been an analyst at Baird for quite a while. And again, I was ready to do something different. I wanted a different growth trajectory and I wanted to try something that wasn't quite as much sitting behind a desk being an analyst. I, I, I learned that I liked to talk more than I liked to be behind a spreadsheet, but I didn't really know what that looked like. And the most important part of this pivotal moment was that I had to ask for help. I had to go and ask my network and people that I met, I had to put it out there. I had to just throw spaghetti at the wall and say, I don't want to be an analyst forever, but I don't know what else I might be good at. What are your ideas? And if you ask enough people that you trust, you will get some feedback. Some of the ideas may be good. Some may be bad. I ended up asking the right person at the right time. And I, I put it out there. I said, I want to leave Wisconsin. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm willing to make a big change, but I need somebody to help me figure out what that change looks like. And I said it to the right person at the right time who was building an investment strategy team. He said, sure. All right. Come to Manhattan. You can be my first external. I had, I mean, this is, this is wild. I had never been a strategist before. I had never given a presentation publicly outside of business school. I had never traveled and talked to financial advisors like that. I had never positioned products in that way. And he, they moved me to New York. They gave me a seat and they basically sent me on the road and said, okay, kiddo, sink or swim. And that was that. And so it was asking for help and then getting to New York and, and having to make the decision on my own because the fear was real. The last thing I want to do is have to go back to Wisconsin with my tail between my legs. So I hope this works out. Then about three months in, I got to the place where I said, I will make sure this works out. I will do everything in my power. I will work as hard as I possibly can, and I will make sure this works out. And it was that determination and just even that commitment to myself, that commitment to my career, the commitment to that big change, no matter how scared. And, and don't get me wrong, there were tears involved in all of these pivotal mm -hmm. moments, but it's the, it was the commitment. It was to keep going no matter what. And it all paid off. I love that story. That, that, that's it's very motivational. So when you, just curious with the nuts and bolts of it. So you come from Wisconsin, you, you know, leaving Wisconsin, you're in New York, and then what you would travel to different locations to meet with what financial advisors, all sorts of groups, and and kind of pitch them on your take on what's going on in the market and what you should do in terms of their allocation and investments. Yeah. And and you, and you probably have these people who've been doing this for 30, 40 years. And you're like, oh my gosh, is, is that what was going on? Like, oh my gosh, how am I going gonna... to- Yeah. And here I was 32 years old, girl yeah. from Wisconsin, suddenly out on the road with financial advisors across the country. I was 
in in all intents and purposes, wheels up on Monday, wheels down Wednesday, Thursday. I spent a lot of time in small towns. I spent a lot of time in big cities. I spent a lot of time in steakhouses. I spent a lot of time in lunchrooms and doing breakfast walkthroughs. And anybody who's ever been in a financial advisor's office knows what that means. But it was conversations that were one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many, maybe it was a team. So let's say me and three other people. Sometimes it was presentations to a room full of 15 that were more informal and casual. Sometimes it was stage presentations at a conference. And I'll tell you the first presentation I ever gave in that job, it was in a, a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. I think I spoke for about eight minutes. Uh, it was informal. I, I wasn't really sure because I was so new. I wasn't really sure what they were expecting from me or even what I was supposed to be doing yet. So I admit that the presentation probably wasn't all that great, but it was short. It was informed. It was, you know, not that big of a deal. It was me kind of getting my feet wet. It was a lunch meeting at the time. It wasn't, you know, a conference where I was on stage and I had a financial advisor come up to me afterwards and basically tell me for the following 40 minutes how terrible it was, how bad, and how it didn't work. And and I was devastated. And I, you know, it was first of all, I was like, how does he have 40 minutes of feedback about an eight-minute presentation explaining about how I should be better and blah, blah, blah. And I went back to my hotel room. I tried to quit. I called that boss and I said, This isn't for me. I'm not doing this every day. Uh-uh. And his response to me was something along the lines of welcome to the big leagues, put your big girl pants on and get back out there. <laughs> I mean, there, were, yeah. there was like very little sympathy, right? Very little coddling. It was just like, okay, well, got that one under your belt. Keep on moving. And he was right because had I given up in that moment, I wouldn't have gotten any better. I would have stopped where I thought I failed and that would have been the end of it. But that particular moment, as painful as it was, and, and I, I mean, I cried in my hotel room. I had to go to a dinner that night. I showed up with puffy eyes. It was bad. But that moment, I had to shift my perspective from, oh my God, how terrible, I'm so humiliated, to how do I use that to make sure that that never, ever happens again? Nobody ever can give me feedback with that kind of material again. I will do so much better every single time. It drove me to take notes and do the spilled milk exercises and what went well, what didn't go well, how do I get better? How do I, how do I handle different groups differently? It was, it actually gave me fire in my belly to be like, I will, I will prove him wrong. And you know what? I don't even know who this guy is. I couldn't find him again. If I tried no idea, <laughs> but he's somewhere out there and I'm still proving him wrong. <laughs> this episode of the blind ambition with Jack Kelly is brought to you by BetterHelp. for anyone out there who needs to hear this. You are more than your job. Don't get us wrong. Passion for your work is great, but it's so important to find joy, fulfillment and validation in your life as a whole, not just at work. And therapy can help you get there. We all go through ups and downs in our career. Maybe you're thinking about switching career paths or you're feeling super burned out in your job. You might be struggling with the uncertainty of our current economy or trying to manage the anxiety that can come up during the job interview process. Whatever it is, you're not alone and therapy can help. Therapy gives you a place to talk through what's going on at work in a safe and supportive environment, figure out what goals you have for your life and career, and build the confidence to go out and make them happen. Otherwise, it's easy to stick at the same old, even if it's not making you happy. If you're interested in giving therapy a try, BetterHelp offers affordable online therapy on a flexible week-to-week -week schedule so you can fit it into your day. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get started, then BetterHelp will match you with a licensed therapist based on your needs, preferences, and goals. Connect with your therapist by text, phone, or video call. Start the process in minutes and switch therapists anytime. Elevate your work and your life with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash TeamBlind for 20% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash T-E-A-M-B-L-I-N-D for 20% off your first month. Liz, this is hilarious because that I was going to ask you the question, how did people respond to you? And did you have people who were being jerks and mean? And then you went right oh. into that. You yeah. know what? And, and I'm not even saying this to be politically correct. Yeah. Thank God he existed. Thank God that happened. Mm -hmm. And that it happened the first time. Because it was, I, I don't even know that I needed necessarily a wake up call, yeah. but it was that first punch in the gut mm -hmm. of 
me asking myself, do you have what it takes? Do you have what it takes to get punched in the gut like this a few more times? Because it's going to keep happening. So get used to it. Like you're not in Kansas anymore. Right? That's, that's how I felt. I was out there on my own. I was part of a team, but I was always going to be traveling on my own like that. It, it got me ready fast. It was, if there was such a thing as drinking from the fire hose and, and getting whacked over the head with you're in a new job and the expectations are different and you are now open to unsolicited opinions and feedback <laughs> that here we go. And, you know, you better like it and you better, you better want to do it because it's going to take a lot of perseverance. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but I, I find your approach very refreshing because mm. we often hear that finance is very high stakes. The the bottom 10% are going to get fired. So you, you, mm. you, know, you don't want to put yourself in that position where you're necessarily taking those risks, where perhaps it makes most sense for your career or most makes most sense for you to do what, you know, you've been always taught to do, stick with the boss and team that you know, mm. you know, don't push any waves and just, you know, continue to grinding out for a couple more years but you move from wisconsin to manhattan you changed functions changed teams you, you traveled around the country and you know didn't necessarily like have you know a days every single time you know for those oh God, folks no. that want <laughs> for those folks that want to go into finance but they hear all of these myths these stereotypes about the culture about how you have to always be perfect or always be on you know, yeah. what would you say to those folks? Yeah. One of the biggest misconceptions is that everything in finance is the same. Oh. Something that I learned early on, and I'm, I'm grateful that I learned it early on, is that this industry is humongous. And it'll start to feel very small once you've been in it long enough because you realize how much people's paths overlap. The industry and the options inside of it are so vast that I don't doubt there are certain pockets of it and, and maybe even large pockets of it that maybe I've never been exposed to that are very much like that. I know that there are very competitive parts of it. And particularly when you're younger and you're trying to get that analyst position at Goldman and it, you, there's these coveted firms that people want to get right. into, those are very competitive. And many of those companies only hire out of certain universities. So you don't even get a look. So that stuff does exist. But I am here to tell you that, you know, girl from Wisconsin went to a state school for undergrad. I didn't go to an Ivy League. I didn't come out of the analyst rotation program at Goldman or Morgan Stanley. I didn't have that pedigree. There is a different type of mentality that it takes. And I did pay my dues, but it did require me as well to be scrappy about it and be creative about what my identity in this industry needed to be. And something that I tell my mentees is, first of all, don't make a five-year plan. Definitely don't make a 10-year plan. And that usually sounds like counterproductive advice. But if you do that too young, you end up with tunnel vision. And it's like, I only, I have to stay on this plan and I will only listen and entertain opportunities that fit on this roadmap. And you don't want to do that to yourself too early because some of the most beautiful opportunities are the ones that come out of left field that you kind of look at and, and say, I would never would have considered that. Or why would I do something like that? A lot of the stuff that, that I did that took me in the right direction were opportunities like that, where I had to sit back and say, okay, maybe, I mean, it seems like it's off the path of what I thought I wanted to do, but maybe I should give it a shot. The other thing is, and this is the hard, the hard part of it, is that when you're younger and, and even when you're in your 30s, always have an idea of, I need to figure out what your edge is. And what I mean by that is, it doesn't mean that you have to be the Michael Jordan of analytics. It doesn't mean that you have to you know, be the, the creme de la creme, have passed every test and be a straight A student. That is not at all what I mean. I mean, figure out who you are and what you do that's different from your peer group. What sets you apart? What makes you different? Not what makes you smarter, not what makes you the, the better fit for that. You know, it's, it's what makes you different because then you use that for the rest of your career as not just what makes you different, but it's also what lights you up. I started to figure it out in my late twenties, maybe early thirties that I said it before, I like to talk. I like to talk more than I like to sit and crunch numbers on a spreadsheet. 
I like the spreadsheet stuff too, but I want to do that. And then I want to talk about it. Right. And I'm simplifying that a lot, but I realized that part of my desire and my enjoyment in the job was talking to financial advisors about a strategy and trying to explain to them in simplified terms, here's what happened, here's why it happened, and here's why I think you could use it. Right. And getting to that point of, oh, I'm I'm good at taking something very complex and distilling it down into a digestible piece. And I really enjoy it. I love watching people have that aha moment. But in order to do that, I have to put myself in those situations. I have to find jobs that allow me to do that. So I became a communicator in this industry. People don't typically go into finance and say, you know what, I'm going to go into finance because I like to communicate. That's not at all the plan, right? But I figured out that, okay, I like finance. I'm good at finance, but I also need to use my special skill set to be even better in this industry and, and carve out my spot in this industry. And there is no such thing as the same spot for everybody. I'm going to tease you a little bit, but what if you're someone listening to the show and you hear that advice and you don't necessarily feel that you have something different, right? You, you have oh, a five-year yes, plan of... Oh, really? Everybody does. <laughs> Everybody does. And you know what? You, I, I totally get that because it's hard, especially when you're young, you're told to, here's the formula and, you know, just work hard and you will be recognized. You know what? Another thing in this, one of the mistakes that I made earlier on was I figured that if I just worked hard enough, somebody would notice. I, I sat around and I waited for somebody to notice that I worked hard or that I didn't make as many mistakes as somebody else, or that I, I was a better employee, whatever, right? I, I sat around and I waited for people to notice. So don't do that. Don't wait. <laughs> you got to tell them. You got to tell them. And there's a, a very artful way to sing your own praises without sounding arrogant. It can be awkward, but it takes practice. And it gets easier and it gets more natural. When you're hearing yourself talk, you're not shuddering at your own words coming out. I mean, the first time I asked for a raise, my hands were shaking. I was sweating. My voice was warbling. I am not kidding you. I was asking, they had offered me $40,000 a year. I was asking for 45 and I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And it was part of a promotion. They were giving me a promotion and I was afraid to ask for more money in a promotion. But it required me to lay out my case of here's why I think I deserve more. Here's what I'm going to do. And I practiced it. I had my bullet points written out. I was still terrified. So I asked for 45. Their reaction was something like, oh, let's see what we can do. And they came back and gave me 44. I couldn't believe how easy it was. But that was the first time. And then every time after that, I had to go in and, and stand up for myself and say, I think I did a really good job at this, or here's what I think I brought to the table. It got easier and easier. You have to practice that. You have to practice telling people what you did that was different, maybe from somebody else, or what you did that was really good, what you uniquely brought to the table in that task, in that project, in that job. You know, it reminds me about NVIDIA. And Jen, Jensen, what he was saying, he doesn't want people from Ivy League schools. He wants PhDs, poor, hungry, and driven. So mm. kind of remind me of what you were talking about, where Jensen was saying is that they just take it for granted. Everything's going to work out and not, you don't have to put in that hustle. Whereas other people who didn't have that ped, quote unquote pedigree were going to be driven and hungry and they want it more. And he's like, those are the kind of people that I want. And those are the people who you see succeed a lot, right? Where, because they don't just say, hey, I'm, I'm going to wait. Someone's going to notice me and I'm going to get this job. No, they're pushing and pushing and going for it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of sounds a lot what you were yeah, doing. I, yeah, well, it. and uh, you know, I want to be fair to the Ivy Leaguers too, because yeah. I, I think there are plenty of hard workers who come out of those schools. I, I think it's really, it's more along the lines of um, the opportunity set might be different coming out of a school like that because there are certain companies that will only pluck from schools like that. So if you're at a different school, if you're at a, lib a small liberal arts school in Nebraska, right, Goldman isn't like banging down your door trying to find that, that one student in Nebraska that's going to be the next 
you know, best analysts they've ever had. So you have to work harder to get yourself in front of those opportunities. I think also believe that you can figure out a way to do that, that it isn't just decided for you. It's, you know, there's no way that you're ever going to make it to that point or make it to that level because those companies aren't recruiting from your school or because you didn't get into that school. So it's the opportunity set. Work ethic, I don't want to paint with a broad brush on on anybody. I do think there's sometimes more hunger and and grit and and scrappiness, like I mentioned before, uh, if you have to claw your way up. But there can also be the opposite. There can also just be this this chatter in your head that says, I can never achieve that, so I should settle for less. And that doesn't have to be how it is. Knowing that the opportunity set may be different and that the exposure that you have may be different, you do have to work harder to get yourself in front of the right opportunities, or maybe maybe there's an extra couple steps in order to get you to those opportunities, but they're not impossible and they're not unreachable. You mentioned that you mentor a lot of younger professionals who are looking to get into finance or earlier in their careers in finance. Can you share some maybe common professional or career mistakes that you see folks make over and over that you kind of wish like, girl, I, I wish you would stop doing this? Yes. The first of which is comfort zone. You're young, you're coming out of school, you get your first job and you decide that that now I know how to do that. I should just keep doing that. And no, no, (laughs) this is your moment. Like, like go screw some stuff up, (laughs) right? Like you can imagine how I might say that more passionately, go screw some stuff up, like go take a job that you may, may not even like, go take a job that you're convinced you won't be good at. How do you know? have to find out what you might enjoy and what you you'll surprise yourself, right? Don't pigeonhole yourself into, well, I only want to trade junk debt because that's what I did. And that's what my resume says. So that those are the only interviews that you're going to get. I think that's how it ends up feeding off of itself. You have so little experience when you're young that you've got one job, maybe an internship. And if they're both in the same corner of the universe, Of course, those are the calls that you're going to get. Those are the interviews that'll be easy to get because that's what your experience says that you can do and you've already been successful at it. Again, the opportunity set that comes to you is going to look a lot like the opportunity set that's already on your resume. But that moment is when you need to try to diversify your resume away from it. And you're young enough still that employers aren't going to see you as pigeonholed. They're willing to give you a chance at something different because they're not sure yet. You're not sure yet embrace the unsureness of it and try a couple different things. That's one thing in particular. And the other ones that, that I really try to drill into them, things like don't make a plan that, that gives you tunnel vision, make sure that you're keeping your options open, figure out what your edge is, and then focus on that. And also just be willing to say yes, be willing to ask for help, be willing to say yes, and go forth knowing that nothing is for sure. Nothing is guaranteed. And sometimes that's the great part about it. I will say um, SoFi is the fourth company I've worked for in my career. And it's the first one that's less than a hundred years old. So the first three were old. I went from old stodgy bank to old stodgy bank to old stodgy bank. And I kept promising myself I would work for something younger and something smaller than the the company that I, and and I really enjoyed my time at BNY Mellon. It was literally the first stock traded on the New York Stock Exchange. It was founded by Alexander Hamilton. It doesn't get any older than that. And it's huge. It is enormous. It's something like 40 cents of every dollar that goes around BNY touches, whatever it is. But I mean, the biggest and the oldest. And then I went from that to SoFi. So first, I went from the first stock ever traded on the New York Stock Exchange to SoFi, and we went public about two months after I joined. So from first stock ever to IPO. And- it was like night and day. Um, the culture is different. The speed is different. Everything about it is is a very different feel. And I had a mentor, well, actually the, the same guy I've mentioned before. What he said to me when I was working for him, and I'll never forget it, was it was about happiness in your career. And he said, only 20% of being happy in your career is about job content. 80% is about the people you work with. I will carry that with me forever and make decisions using that information. And I think that's really important too, when you're thinking about being in this industry, it's not just about 
what am I going to be looking at on my computer screen every day? What am I going to be typing about on my computer screen every single day? It's who am I interacting with? Who do I want to be interacting with? Who do I resonate best with? Right. There are certain client types that I don't resonate as well with. And then there are certain client types that I'm really good at being in front of. So knowing that about yourself and knowing what types of teams you work better in, bigger teams, smaller teams, do you want a flat organizational structure or do you enjoy the hierarchy of it? Do you know all of that? How much autonomy do you want? And keeping that in mind just as much, if not more, than trying to figure out whether or not you're good at investment banking versus sell side analytics. Yeah, I, I appreciate those reminders. And I really think that our audience, even though the folks that you know aren't necessarily in finance can get a lot out of your advice. So thanks for coming on the show, Liz. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Right, thank you, Liz. That's it for The Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.